Welcome back again to our um, um, series, uh, one of our series of the lectures. Um, I'm going to uh, be recording this lecture as well. So uh, we'll wait just for a few minutes once everybody loads up. Uh, again, uh, my name is Tamir Nakhal and I'll be um, today discussing with you um, Critical Appraisal, which is, as you may know, it's a series of seven lectures um, in order to give you a snapshot of how to uh, perform a research from A to Z in a, in a, in a very quick kind of uh, matter. It's a very condensed uh, as well um, kind of um, lectures where uh, a lot of information flows in but i hope that you enjoy it um i thought i'd share this picture with you this was a picture i've taken in in gulmarg in kashmir in 2018 one of the most beautiful views i've seen in my life in the himalayas so um we will kick start at the moment uh, so the outline of this as you may know that uh, we started with an introduction, we gave basic statistics one and two, and then uh, we uh, today we are going to discuss the critical appraisal, and then we still have three more. Last one will um, have uh, an interview-like structure, where those who have completed 70% of the homeworks, uh, then we will discuss writing uh, the research paper and publishing. All these uh, lectures will be available on YouTube. I've started my YouTube channel where you can actually um, uh, watch them or, or catch up with the lectures. So what is uh, critical appraisal? Uh, so this is uh, the systematic process of carefully assessing the result or outcome of the scientific of the scientific research um, and to assess its trustworthiness, uh, value and relevance in a particular context. يعني بشوف هل فعلا البحث المعمول هاد حقيقي هل البحث هادا uh, بقدر أثق فيه أو لا as well as assess other factors such as the internal validity and we will discuss that in a second adherence to reporting standards whether it is actually adherent with the standards or not to assess the conclusion what does the article tell you about? What is the conclusion? Is this relevant to your practice as a doctor, as a nurse? Uh, and of course, generalizability, whether that piece of information that you have read in an article is actually generalizable, yani you can apply it to the community. There are lots of tools that uh, may help you in the critically appraising, uh, uh, of course, an article. So what is a tool uh, or what is the critical appraisal tool? So this is a structured documented evidence to help in establishing research validity and the level of evidence. So there are different tools you can see online. One of them is the CASP <coughs> checklist where you can actually go and watch uh, and you can um, appraise an article. Similarly, those tools, there are access tools, GBI tools, are used to critically appraise the cross-sectional studies. There is Cochrane risk of bias, GBI, CASP tools could be used for critically appraising randomized control trials. And we, we will get to know more about these tools, so don't worry about it. Just be aware that there are tools that you can use in helping you critically appraise a paper. So I, I spoke before about internal validity. What does that mean? Internal validity means that uh, how well a study can rule out an alternative explanation or alternative explanations for it's usually the sources of the error of its findings. So let's say you found out that smoking, let's say, uh, may cause cancer, yeah? And your study says, oh, smoking causes cancer. Is that entirely correct? Um, well, or lung cancer, you have to speculate it. You have to rule out all the alternative explanations in your uh, sample. So, other, uh, of course, other alternatives would be uh, to um, look for um, explanations like whether the, the 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 sample was exposed to. Uh, benzene oil uh, like materials, whether the sample had been exposed to radiation, whether they were in wars, how is the degree of pollution, all these things so that you can firmly say, okay, so actually smoking has attributed rather than is the cause of lung cancer. <clears throat> 
And so that's called internal validity. Interferences are said to possess internal validity uh, if a causal relationship between two variables is properly demonstrated. يعني لما يكون في عندك اثنين حوادث حصلت وعارف انت ان هذول الاثنين are directly related to each other and they are causal يعني واحد سبب الاخر then you'd say this is an internally valid and it's composed of three components <coughs> the first one which is called temporal predescence or precedence which is the cause precedes effect يعني المسبب اجى قبل التاثير او جا ما بعد يعني ما قبل ما يحصل الاثر and then you have co-variation which is cause and reflect tend to occur together so the cause and effect tend to, to occur together that's called co-variation <clears throat> and finally non-spuriousness which the, which causes that there are no plausible alternative explanation for the observed covariation. Had kulhum, those are called the criteria for a valid causal inference. So it's composed of three temporal precedence and covariation and non spuriousness. So those three basically, in a lesson, we can have effect, will effect a bli as a cause, who and the command, the cause will effect, they occur together. And of course, lastly, that is, there is no plausible alternative explanation. Anyway, <clears throat> we'll continue. There is something called clinical equipose, or muazana sariria. What does that mean? This means that you have to clinically weigh. لازم توازن القرار اللي أنت أو اللي حتدخل فيه كسؤال بحثي. The, be the benefits and the harm caused, which involves assigning patients to different treatments arm of a clinical trial. So let's say you have a, a new drug uh, or a drug that you know that it's 100% very important for this condition uh, and you want to compare it with another with no drug, then you cannot do that if you know that the, the drug itself is significantly um, better or is significantly as a, uh, considered as a cure towards that condition and carry on with the trial. So in, in this situation, treatment A, you're sure 100% that it's gonna work. Uh, let's say, for example, aspirin and clopidogrel in MI versus no aspirin and clopidogrel in MI. This is not a valid question. This is not a valid research. And here, there is an ethical problem and that will cause clinical equipose, which means that you actually will not carry on with this research. So the basics of it is that always you have to have the null hypothesis, uh, and then that there is no decisive evidence that one is better. And this is your basics in any question. And you can have a null hypothesis that there is no um, significant relation or difference between both treatments. And the second thing, you as a researcher or whoever is doing the research should have no decisive evidence in his mind that that is much better or highly significant or superior to the other treatment. That causes your research to be valid and you can proceed with it. Otherwise, your research is not valid and actually your research cannot proceed. So let's give you this kind of, some kind of an example. If the clinician knows or has good reasons to believe that a new therapy, for example, therapy A, is better than another therapy, which is therapy B, he cannot participate in a comparative trial of therapy A versus B. We know 100% and it's a new drug and this is very important and you uh, want to compare it with something that is completely irrelevant, you cannot do that. So ethically, the clinician is obliged to give therapy A to each of the patients because you will not uh, abandon the, uh, that therapy for all other patients, isn't it? You don't want to put your patients at risk um, because of your um, uh, trial. So that makes us move into, uh, we can carry on towards bias, our inhiyas. What does it mean? I thought I'd put it simple because there is a lot of things you can read on your own, but simply putting it, doing something in favor of uh, X against 
why. So let's say you're doing something and your feeling is towards that, then you uh, try to emphasize and put your efforts towards it. For example, a selection bias. This is very important in, 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 in your research as well as in your day-to-day -day life. So an example of that would be during job interviews. If two people know each other and you know better a better candidate, then of course that would be partly a selection bias if there is feelings around it. But to be more professional, major sources of bias in any clinical research, I thought that this is a nice diagram which will show you that the, the research or trial progression or any research progression starts with the planning stage, implementation stage, and then analysis and publication. And in each one of these stages, you can get bias. So you can uh, get actually a flawed study design. So the study design is actually completely wrong and you're doing uh, a completely uh, wrong uh, research design, but you're carrying on with that because you're convinced that it's right. Of course, selection bias, so the, something we call inclusions and uh, inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. And of course, channeling bias uh, throughout the um, planning process. And then when you implement it, if you give, for example, your um, essays to uh, uh, different people and they're all, they should be all trained in the same manner. But if they interview in a different way, there will, there will be an interviewer bias if it's not one person or two persons who are adequately, let's say, trained. Uh, of course, chronological bias, recall bias. So when you ask a patient, when was the time, last time you had, a, let's say, a fatty food? And they tell you, oh, uh, maybe yesterday. So that's the, that may be in that art, you know, when you are asking for, um, let's say, for causes of cholestatis pain after eating a fat food and they tell you oh, I'm not sure when it was so that's called the recall bias they can't remember very much what they had or exactly at what time was it there is of course transfer bias all different types of bias and then at the pub publication itself there is citation bias you take the different so when you do the literature review you pick up the articles that you want in your references and of course there is the confounding uh, bias or confounding factors that can cause a lot of bias into your work. And this is just to be aware of it, that when you're reading an article, that there is something called bias and just watch out for it. And it's worth just having a read uh, about uh, what are the different types of biases. So after all this, where do we start really? A lot of information, a lot of um, uh, jargon. So I thought I'd put it simple. So first, you have to have in your mind a structure. When you are downloading a paper and you want to critically appraise it, you have to have a structure. And I was looking through different kind of websites, different uh, methodologies and structures. And I believe when I was um, an, an F1, we used the tool uh, to critically appraise. And this was called the critical appraisal form. And these were, of course, during our journal clubs because we had them weekly. So we always had uh, this nice booklet, which I will show it to you, uh, which we use from a website, which is this one. Yeah, and I'm happy to share, of course, the website as well as the um, uh, PowerPoint itself. So always they start with the author's title of the article, the journal itself, what's the name of it, the volume and page, and then the year, and then you carry on with the uh, methodology. So that gives you an idea where to start. And then th that gives you an idea also whether this is a relevant article, whether this is a high impact article, etc. So that's number one. Number two is download the whole article. So your task will be today, after this lecture, to download this article, which is Crofidogrel and Aspirin after ischemic stroke or transient ischemic attack, an updated systematic review and meta-analysis. And that will be from the Journal of uh, uh, thrombol uh, Thrombolysis, yeah? And it's uh, kind of uh, a year old. Uh, and then once you download it, make sure that you see all the articles. So the whole article should compose, be composed of title, authors, affiliations, abstract. And of course, after that, you'd have the body of the article, which is composed of the introduction, the method, results, discussion, and conclusion. And at the end, you will find some references and maybe you can find, uh, let's say they tell you that the article was sponsored by X company. And that will give you, of course, a degree you think oh is there a degree of bias let's say if the company produces the drug then you think okay there might be financial aid towards having that article published in that manner so is there a bias in that uh, area anyway so what you would have to do is to read that and after you download it and then you appraise it um 
don't worry about all this jargon in here and questions. It's just, just to give you an idea how the question should be considered and formulated when we are appraising a meta-analysis. So again, we are looking whether it's valid, whether you trust that article and the results, whether it adds any value or relevance to your clinical practice. And those are the questions that you would ideally ask yourself. Are the results of the study valid? Was the research question focused and clear? Was the literature research systematic? Was the study selection process systematic? And all these different questions that you will go through, which I'll show you in a second. So again, just before, so that's uh, um, as we do usually, this is the PubMed ID for that article where you can download it. Uh, and this uh, will be your IA QR code, which you can, uh, with the telephone, uh, scan it, and that will take you straight into the Survey Monkey, and then you can complete the um, homework in there. So just before that, I wanted to show you this uh, very nice article, which if you click the link, if you'd like, I can send you the um, uh, the uh, PowerPoint presentation, and you can click the link, and you can see here what is what it is composed of. So it's ba basically, I'm simply putting it's a booklet, and this booklet has got most of the questions that you, as a starter in any journal club, when you're appraising an article, you should be uh, utilizing. So I'll show you a, a bit of a sample of it. So I'll just zoom in, and this is very nice because it's an interactive, and I think you can also. Um, uh, um, printed out. So if you go up, um, you can see that um, there is different questions that you can answer. So let me go to the beginning and I'll show you how uh, we used to fill it. So we have here a section uh, of the article. I'm going to zoom a bit. Uh, and of course you have all the article and the journal itself. And uh, then there are the section B, which tells you about whether it's not clear or not reported or not applicable or not qualified. And you'd go through the whole list of criteria. So has it has a hypo does it have a hypothesis? Is there a source of population identified? And then you'd say yes or no. Is there inclusion? Is there, is there exclusion criteria? Is there, what are the numbers of excluded and why? withdrawals, sample size, this is very important. We will speak about and talk about power in the next uh, slides or in the next uh, lectures. And then the statistical analysis, whether it was appropriate, whether it was adjusted, whether the results are reliable. And then as you go further, you will start appraising the diagnostic tool itself. Yeah, so you will uh, know whether the diagnostic test was right, uh, or you'll write it down, and then you'd see what's the gold standard, and you'd see what is the main source of subjects, etc., in details. And then the intervention, if you want to, to uh, appraise an intervention trial, and then if you have any cohort studies that you want to um, appraise as well, etc. So this is a, a very nice kind of document that takes you through what to think and how to think when you're reading a paper. There are other tools as well, and those are all available online, like this one, the JBI. You can critically appraised, you can download them on your tablet, computer, and you can have the, your own checklists when you're uh, kind of critically appraising other case report even, a case control, and etc. So if you click on one of the, let's say, a case report, uh, you, it takes you straight into it, you can download it, and that will help you, of course, in, in, in your developing of your thinking skills and critical appraisal skills. And again, a similar manner, it just gives you a tick box exercise and thinking about the demographics, history, was it was clearly documented, all these things, and it takes you through them. And so I thought I'd show you, um, just for those who are joining, how to um, download or how to find the paper. So again, if, you, if I go back to our homework, um, and uh, you copy and paste the PubMed ID and just paste it in here. It should ideally uh, be evident in your um, screen. Meanwhile, whilst it's opening, um, of course, um, there is the CASP, C-A-S-P, which is another tool that you can uh, use electronically. And again, you can download all the checklists and just go through. Once you've downloaded the um, article itself, um, you can actually, and I will show you the article once it's downloaded. 
um, you can start reading it and appraising the article. So this is the article which I've downloaded. And uh, as you go, so simply putting, you start by reading where was it and you fill in the gaps as you go, fill all the questions. Uh, similarly, you will find it on this monkey survey. So which journal, what's the impact factor? And just for those who are asking what's about, what's the impact factor? It is the number of citations towards that journal itself, which is the article published in. So if the impact factor is high, then the journal is very highly recognized and it's in a huge circulation and a lot of research and publication linked to that journal. Examples, for example, the Lancet, Cell, Nature, all these are very hugely uh, heavy um, kind of high impact journals. In this kind of um, trial or in this uh, article, you'd look into uh, what they are questioning and you'd know that this is a systematic review and meta-analysis. So you already know that this is the highest level of evidence. And then you'd see when was it published and by whom. And then you start reading, of course, the abstract uh, and and uh, slowly look into um, the body of it. So, and that's the introduction which I told you about. So each article is composed of an introduction where they basically did their literature review. And during that literature review, they looked at what other people have said about this subject and what do we know so far about this subject. And then at the end, of course, those numbers, which you can see, those are the references which they have found. So let's say they've done their Prisma flow, which we discussed at the very beginning, and we will go into further details in the next lecture. Um, once they've identified the articles that are relevant, they've congregated them, they read them, and now they were able to write the introduction. And of course, they followed the guidelines, and usually at the end of it, they have, um, so what they have used, and what they have registered, and what is the um, aim of it. And then if you move along, you'll find that there is the selection criteria and data extraction. So again, you will start filling, as you go, what are their selection criteria? What was the exclusion and inclusion criteria for this study? And then each study has got an outcome. The reason why you are doing it, because you want to get an outcome, whether it's a primary outcome or secondary outcome. So the primary outcome is the big outcome that you're seeking it or you are kind of investigating towards it. But sometimes when you're going along the research project, you find, aha, there are maybe some other outcomes that I can look into that. So secondary outcomes, yeah? And of course, you put a definition to your outcome. So uh, define exactly what you want to say. So let's say if you want to investigate an MI within, uh, after an operation, just don't leave it blind. Say MI incidents within the first 30 days uh, in the post-operative period. And then you know that it's within the 31st days. And the question would be, why have you picked 30 days and not 60, for example? I would say, oh, because the literature have found that the incidence of having an MI during the first 30 day is, for example, that's just a made up number, let's say 5%, yeah, or 4%. And I want just to investigate it because I found when I was practicing that uh, actually we have a higher number of MIs. And I found that actually 20% of these people have MI. and just wanted to see what's the difference and where are we in compared to the standard, yeah? Or the definition in the literature review. And then, of course, they've put here some quality assessments of it. How did they assess the randomized control trial? And then they spoke about the statistical analysis. So they went into their methodology. And then again, it's, it's kind of fun because you know already what's a Prisma and you can uh, easily understand how they did it. Uh, so then you would move into the results. And again, in the uh, homework itself, you'll find that there is per each section in the result, what specifically I'm looking for. So the p-value, the confidence interval, what test did they use? Was the result relevant or significant? And what are the randomized control trials showing? And you can just skim through the, um, uh, tab uh, the tables uh, just to see what are the studies, etc. cetera. Um, and then afterwards, you would move into further details as we have discussed the other day, uh, the risk ratios and how they've calculated it and what was the uh, final um, kind of end point of it. And it would be fun just to have a look uh, and uh, finalize it and understand what is the efficacy of the outcome so how did they find it? 
And then afterwards, you'd move into um, looking at what they have wrote about the subgroups analysis. And don't worry about this. It's a little bit more advanced, but if sometimes you are analyzing, when you're doing the big sample, and you find that a smaller sample can actually be analyzed per se, that's called a subgroup. So from the whole group, you've done smaller analysis to get farther tuning towards your question. And that sometimes can be done. Uh, especially if you are doing uh, meta-analysis and randomized control trials. Anyway, so you'd read through, and then after the results, of course, you'd have discussion. This is the, uh, the bulk, the component that they discuss their results with other papers or with other available results uh, on PubMed or anywhere where research is published, even in books, etc. And here, this bit is the bit that you start discussing, especially when you are submitting a, an, an, an article to a journal, because the, the, that would be the interesting bit to see how your results were different or compared to other uh, results in other randomized control trials, meta-analyses, and what does it find? And this typically leads you to the, um, as we said, the uh, final analysis, uh, which will give you the conclusion, as they say. So once you're there, you know that you found the conclusion, and that is the conclusion that is answering partly or fully, or actually uh, saying that there is no relation to your question or relevance to your question that you've asked. Uh, and then of course, there will be some acknowledgements sometimes if somebody uh, has contributed to it. Uh, and then always read the ethical standards and just know what was the conflict of interest, whether somebody has financed them uh, or uh, financed the article itself. So you would see that they've received, for example, a grant. Yeah, so a minha. So that will uh, give you an impression that uh, it was uh, sponsored by a party, but okay, it's not a relevant party and it's a grant towards doing something. So that raises a bias, etc. And then you'd go into references. In references, there are different styles in referencing, um, Vancouver style, other styles, but usually what they do is the first author and then all other authors, and then the uh, year and um, the year of publication, and then you'd have uh, the uh, the name or the title, and then the journal, as well as the DOI number or whatever. So this is called references, yeah? And um, there is a very well-known um, uh, program you can use called EndNote, where, you can work, where it can automatically organize your referencing without bothering, because when you're starting to write the article, uh, you will need to start moving the references. So you see that references are quite a few and always look at what are the years of these references. Ideally, you'd have quite new references uh, and um, mostly and some old references and not all of them are old unless it's a quite new study that has, hasn't been uh, elaborated for the last, let's say, a few years. Uh, and the span should be within 10 to 20 years, not more, unless it's something brand new or something that hasn't been explored at all. So that's kind of going back into all these, um, um, today's section and uh, today's uh, lecture, we discussed critical appraisal and this is the third and we said this is the systematic process that you will be starting to critically appraise and Hatun Qud Al article. And we knew that there are tools. We saw a tool, one of them is CASP, where you can download it, where, uh, or you've seen the others, like the access, you've seen the other tool that I've showed you, which we use, the simplified one. Uh, and then we discussed a bit about internal validity uh, and just to be aware that there is a cause and effect and whether they are linked together with three criteria that you have you to look into it. And then we just made you, I made you aware and alert about something called clinical equipose, just in case someone asks you. And this is actually an ethical uh, question, whether the question that you're raising is ethical to do, uh, especially uh, if there is uh, no decisive or there is a decisive uh, treatment. And then we spoke about bias a little bit, uh, and then I formulated this a small little map in your mind uh, to have a structure in your mind when you are critically appraising a paper. Uh, and I've suggested one of the websites that I sometimes use. And then, um, of course, you can download the whole articles and you should download it and then read it through carefully, highlight it, 
and then as you go through reading the article the second time you start appraising it because you've understood the idea and then you start answering the questions that are relevant and those questions are in that appraisal tool that you will download um, and uh, at the end we said that there is the article that I'd like you to uh, download with the PubMed ID and uh, then you can either copy paste SurveyMonkey or uh, scan the QR code and at the end if you have any questions I'm more than happy to answer them uh, on my email uh, address. Uh, meanwhile, if you have now any questions, please move into the chat window and here you can type in um, all your questions or relevant kind of um, uh, comments that you would like to add on. Um, but that takes, takes us through the uh, third lecture, the bulk of it, and how to critically appraise a paper and what to use. And when you do the homework, you will find, okay, this becomes much easier now because it's a structured uh, uh, work. And I'll show you how I formulated for you the uh, monkey survey so that you're aware of it. I usually tend to have monkey surveys that are seven questions. So it's composed usually of seven questions. And uh, again, that's, so that's your article. If you, are, if you copy and paste it, you will find it as well. And then you say, okay. And then, of course, there are some questions about the paper, about the abstract, about the introduction, about the method and the results, and a bit about the conclusion and the paper importance itself. And then if you leave your full name and email, that will help me uh, identify, of course, those who will complete the 70% to have at the end of it, uh, um, can, some form of an evidence towards uh, that they have attended this course. Uh, as, as well as I will post this video within the next uh, 24 hours on uh, YouTube. Uh, feel free to ask any questions and uh, hoping that this lecture was, uh, or you found it a bit uh, uh, interesting and uh, you can grab and understand the clinical relevance of it towards your uh, researching. Again, thank you all for uh, uh, today's uh, attendance and uh, looking forward to seeing you next Saturday um, and we will be with lecture, literature review uh, where we will discuss how to find the, how to formulate basically the introduction uh, and then that would take us through uh, to know how to write the introduction and then how to start referencing uh, and of course, you already are aware of some of the uh, statistical analyses, uh, which we've discussed during the little, uh, small, you know, amounts in small amounts during the basics of statistics. And at the end, uh, uh, hopefully, with the critical appraisal skills that you will start developing, uh, you will be able to slowly write an article uh, and uh, hopefully publish it, where your names will be there, uh, as well as you will contribute something new to the uh, world of science. Anyway, thank you very much for today, and uh, I hope that you have an enjoyable weekend, and take care. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullah.